What was the single most important thing you think they needed to hear? That I didn't abandon them. He asked the whole world for help, and you responded. A father's heart-wrenching plea on Facebook that went viral, shared nearly one and a half million times. My name is Alan Thomas, and I am looking for my son and daughter, he says. I've been searching for decades. The online response is immediate and overwhelming. Keep sharing, people. This veteran needs our help. Definitely. Prayers, encouragement, even leads pouring in from around the globe. It is time for this daddy to be reunited with his Wouldn't kids. it be wonderful if Facebook can help I find hope twins? the power of social media will help you find your family. He's using social media. To Searching for them. He wanted them. Obsessed with finding his missing children. From when he'd been a young army sergeant in South Korea, another country, another lifetime ago. The twins he'd been forced to leave behind, but could never forget. You had no way of knowing it that day. As you boarded the plane, that was the last time you would see your children. They were taken away from me. But if anyone can bring them back together again, this woman can. A professional people searcher that 2020 brought in. Uh -huh. This will be okay. She is his last best hope. My name his only hope. He's been through hell and back. Work with me. Let's make this right. So tonight, come with us on the amazing search of a lifetime. Is it all? A 45-year-old cold case. A mad dash across two continents. Yes, and 7,000 miles. All the detective work. Let's see how persuasive I can be. The detours. Nobody called you to say the kids are being adopted? Well, that's bull. They could have been separated. The blind alleys and brand new leads. I'm coming. You're not getting rid of me. The hope and the heartache. So messed up. And finally. I found both of them. No way way they're both alive oh my god the unforgettable emotion of a family about to be reunited are you ready to meet your twins tonight on 2020 the searchers good evening i'm elizabeth vargas and i'm david muir right here tonight a story that's perfect for the holidays as so many families are making plans to come together but alan thomas didn't have his complete family until 2020 stepped in to help. And we brought an ace in the hole with us, Pam Slayton, a professional people finder whose job is to find missing loved ones. And with our crack international team, a lifelong search went into high gear. Turn left onto US 12 East. It's very nice to meet you. So you're the young lady I'm gonna talk to, huh? I am the girl, hopefully for the job. We flew Pam Slayton cross country to Mossy Rock, Washington to join forces with former Sergeant Alan Thomas. The retired veteran fought for his country. Now Pam vows to fight for him. If I don't get the answers I want, I'll work my way to the top, but I can assure you that if anyone's gonna try hard, it's gonna be me. So that much I can guarantee you, okay? That's all I can ask. Okay. Fair enough, I reckon. <laughs> Come on in. Alan's daughter Charlene is helping her father on his four decade quest to find the children she grew up knowing only as pictures on the wall. Charlene? Yes. Nice, nice to meet you. You okay? <laughs> no. These are for you. Pam brings flowers and hugs and hope. Yeah, hug. This will be okay. This will be okay. <laughs> My name is Pamela Slayton. I'm an investigative genealogist and my passion is reuniting people. I put in the biological father's name. You may remember Pam's work in a previous episode of 2020, heartwarming, sometimes heart-stopping revelations about yep. missing loved ones. Yep, yep. okay. Doc. Person showing up. On a never-ending search for the missing pieces of people's lives, with her husband Mike at the wheel, Pam's personal story is never far from her mind. She too was adopted and tracked down her birth mother. Now she's putting her years of experience to work for Alan Thomas. His story begins in 1966, the year of Bonanza, the Beatles, and the Baltimore Orioles. Baltimore wins one nothing, sweeping the series in four straight over the Dodgers. But half a world away, South Korea is still a divided and dangerous country with its hair-trigger demilitarized zone. And that is where the U.S. Army sent this 19-year-old GI to work on helicopters. I mean, had you ever been overseas before? 
No, no. It was the first time I'd been overseas. I was excited in a way and scared, uh, homesick. Korea had a thriving nightlife luring all those young American servicemen, and Allen soon met a woman at the non-commissioned officers club. Her name was Soon Gyum, but he had a very American nickname for his new companion. He called her Connie. She was five years older than him, with a son from a previous relationship named Jane. What was she like? Short, petite, mm -hmm. very nice. Then Connie got pregnant. Was that a surprise? Yeah. Yeah, it was a great surprise as far mm -hmm. as I was concerned. Uh, I think it was with her, too, and, uh, you know, so, yeah, I was all for it, you know. When the time came, September 10th, 1967, Alan rushed Connie to the hospital in Seoul and got another surprise. And when did you find out it was twins? Oh, I didn't find out it was twins until she had them. Are you kidding? No. Wow, I remember that day, yeah. What was it like? He's setting eyes for the first time on these two little babies. I loved it. Got a family right now. I, I was really super proud. Connie and the proud father named the twins Sandra and James. About a year later, as soon as the military would allow it, Alan married Connie and adopted her older son, Jane. Judging by the old photos, the twins and their big brother were inseparable. They really fond, fond memories. But when his tour in Korea ended, Alan says he could not get his new family back to the United States. The twins were already American citizens with passports, but there was a problem with passports for Connie and Jane. Alan figured it was just a matter of time and red tape. And we were corresponding, and she kept asking for money, so I kept sending them money. How often would you hear from her? You know, thinking back on it, <laughs> Every time I heard from her, it seems like she wanted more money. <laughs> Alan wanted to get back to Korea and his family so badly, he volunteered to serve in Vietnam. Now, a war at its worst, solely so that he could get 30 days leave in Korea. More than 11,000 Americans would be killed in 1969 in Vietnam. Back home, the anti-war movement, with its protest songs, was in full swing. You asked to go to Vietnam in 1969? Oh, yes, ma'am. I figured if I went over there, I would have stand, then I'd go to Korea and get this situation squared away. You were hoping to be able to visit Korea, visit, Korea. visit your children, yeah, and, and visit and see Connie. see what's going on. And yeah. see what's going on. But when he finally got to Korea, more than a year had passed. And while he loved seeing the children, things with Connie were strained. A lot of things have changed. Like what? Our relationship. I could tell right off. And I sent that things were different. He still remembers the day he had to leave to return to the war. Connie, the twins, and Jane went with him to the airport. I said my goodbyes, but when I turned and started walking on the plane, uh, no way. Uh, hard. It was hard? Just hard. Why? Because you'd had that special 30 days with your kids and... I, I couldn't turn around. Why? Because I, I wouldn't leave. There is a snapshot from that day Alan has saved all these years. It shows little James saluting his dad, the sergeant. You had no way of knowing it that day as you boarded the plane back for Vietnam. But that was the last time you would see your children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alan kept sending support, including U.S. savings bonds, until his letters began bouncing back from Korea. And then he heard from Connie one last time. She wrote offering to hand over the twins, now seven years old, if Alan would come get them. At that time, I just went through a bankruptcy. Uh, it was really hard, and there was just no way I could get, get over there. That's when Alan says Connie vanished somewhere in South Korea, taking the children with her. He couldn't even find her to serve the divorce papers. After a decade in the Army, he married a woman from his hometown and began raising a family in Colorado. He went to work as a machinist in a factory. But even with his growing family in the United States, Alan never forgot about that family in South Korea. My mom had helped my dad search for so long. They did everything they could with the resources that they had. 
um, but always seem to run into roadblocks. Four decades worth of roadblocks, but they are no match for searcher Pam Slayton. Help this man, have compassion. He's been through hell and back. Work with me, let's make this right. The epic story of a soldier searching for his twins now leaps across time and distance from an army airfield in 1960s South Korea to the present day and a home in South Jersey. That's where we find Pam Slayton, and that's where she finds lost loved ones. There's probably 15, 20 cases in there. Pam Slayton is an author and a one-woman department of missing persons. Forced to give up my seven-year-old daughter. Please help us find our son. I don't think people can comprehend how many people are hurting and still out there trying to find somebody important in their life. But now a viral Facebook plea of help me find my twins is about to spark a worldwide search led by Pam. Thank you. At her first meeting with veteran Alan Thomas, he shows her two letters that broke his heart. They arrived in the early 1980s from the State Department and the Pearl S. Buck Foundation, an organization that arranged adoptions for thousands of Asian American children abandoned in Korea by their GI fathers. The letters informed Alan his Korean ex-wife Connie had given away their children, the twins. And amazingly, the letters say he would have no legal right to his children. You must have been apoplectic. I mean, what do you mean they, they were a dog? I'm the father. Yeah, I was highly, highly upset. Where are my rights? I was told I had no rights. There was one piece of good news in that letter. It said the twins had been adopted together in the United States. Okay, so this is 1980 now. Is this the very first time that you're finding out these kids were adopted out into the yeah, U.S.? This is, yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. But since that letter, there have been no new clues. Until now. Alan gets a mysterious Facebook message from Korea from a man named Kunsu Lee. It turns out Lee is a policeman in Seoul specializing in finding missing children, a Korean version of Pam with a badge. He runs an investigative team in Korea and holds the world record for finding more than 3,000 missing children. I feel like I need to get on a plane and go to Korea, but I don't speak the language. That's when the worldwide resources of ABC News went to work for Alan. In Seoul, South Korea, ABC News Bureau Chief Juhi Cho helps us pull back the curtain on the four-decade mystery. Her first stop is a meeting with Mr. Lee. The most important thing for us is to figure out the mother's identity. Almost immediately, a breakthrough. Lee finds the twins' mother, Alan's ex-wife, Connie. She is listed in the Korean government registry. She gave birth to twins, and um, also she was married to Alan Thomas. So we're like, bingo, yay. But the registry says Connie died in 2007. It was her heart. So Juhi's next stop, on the advice of Mr. Lee, is Korea Social Service, a small adoption agency. Juhi mentions Connie's Korean name to the woman at the agency. When I told her the name of Pae Sung Gum and she had twins and, and there was this whole story on Facebook, I got a feeling that she knew who I was talking about, but she wouldn't admit it. The agency tells her Alan has no right to access the adoption records, but there is someone who does. She said, only siblings have rights to ask for it. She gave me that hint. It's like, wow, we didn't even know that loophole. Remember little Jame, the twin's older brother, the boy Alan adopted when he married Connie? Juhi finds him, all grown up now, married with children. He now holds the key to finding the lost siblings, Alan's twins, back in America. The doors were locked unless Jame gave you the key, in essence, yes. with his permission. Yes. But there's a problem. Even after all these years, Jame resents Alan Thomas, the man who once adopted him, because he believes Alan abandoned them. When you first contacted Jame, he wanted nothing to do with you. He said no. Juhi goes to visit Jame and his wife in person. Jame remembers the day his little half-brother and sister vanished. I came home after school and they were gone. I asked my mother about the twins. 
and she told me that they went somewhere, so I just accepted that. Juhi shares some insight about why Connie may have given up the twins for adoption. What would it have been like for these children in growing up in South Korea, these GI babies? Impossible for the mothers to raise them because um, they would have been disowned by their family if they... If they brought home a uh, mixed-race mixed race, baby? Yes, absolutely. It and was they considered that it was, bad. Yes, it was considered that bad. Still reluctant, James is finally persuaded by his wife to give permission for the adoption agency to release the records. Pam Slayton is in the U.S., ready to receive them. I woke up and I could see that I got an email from Korea. And I can't even tell you how excited I was. This was the break she'd been waiting for. The email explains someone back in Korea had changed the twins' date of birth, making them appear to be a year younger and making tracing them nearly impossible. So you had spent all that time yes. searching. Yes. And had that birth date off by a year and a, and a month. Yeah. But Pam is finding out nothing is easy with this search. And I start working my databases over and over again, and I'm coming up empty again. Even with the correct birth date? Even with the correct date of birth. Ever persistent, Pam goes looking for the twins' adoption records. There are copies in the archives of the Pearl S. Buck Foundation in Pennsylvania. Pam calls, but gets nowhere. And I said, well, please let your boss know. I'll be stopping by. I'll be in the area. I was kind of like, I'm coming. You're not getting rid of me. I'm presently in Perkasy, Pennsylvania. I'm about to go see the Pearl Buck foundation. I don't know what they're going to be willing to disclose to me. Let's see how persuasive I can be. Not persuasive enough, as it turns out, they still offer no help because adoption records here are kept private by law. I, I got all Queens girl. You went Queens girl on her? I went Queens girl. Being the stubborn woman that I am, I call the agency back. Can you check what's known as the order of adoption? She gets back on the phone, she's like, wow. She said, you're right, the names were changed. Hmm. Changed to what? Well, <laughs> I said, for instance, Sandra, something maybe similar to Sandra. She said something similar. <laughs> wow. What about James? James' first name's completely changed. She said, however, he did keep part of his name. Well, that's telling me his first name, James, is now probably his middle name. So I said, well, thank you very much. I will try not to bother you again. So the two of you are basically playing a little game. We're playing a game. Cough if I'm close. Right. <laughs> With the correct date of birth and information that Alan's son may have the middle name James, Pam dives back into her databases. So I figured, OK, let me pop James in the middle, see what I get. And I'm going through all my lists. And then this one person, Timothy James Parker, catches my eye. Timothy James Parker. Could he be half of the 40-year-old mystery? The hunt for two missing children bridges two continents, Asia and North America, two cultures, East and West. And now the case is closer to being solved than at any time in nearly half a century, thanks to two women, our searcher Pam Slayton and ABC News Korean bureau chief Juhi Cho who has just arrived in New York after a 14-hour flight. I'm Judy. I know you are. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You did a lot. You were the, you were the key that unlocked the door. They've been working together on opposite sides of the world for several months. You know what I'm going to do? And now they're about to crack the case. After combing through countless false leads and phone numbers, Pam finds one that rings true. She finds the number for a man in Missouri named Timothy James Parker. Pam believes he could be Alan's long lost son. He's not home when she calls, but a roommate answers. And I said, well, is he by any chance Korean? He said, oh yeah, he is. I said, oh, I said, um, is he a twin? He says, yeah. Hmm. I said, he has a twin sister? And he says, yeah, Susan. I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, you did I, it. I had to contain myself. Now Pam has a name for the female twin named Sandra when she was born in Korea. 
She is now Susan, living in Wisconsin. Now I jump on the computer, I run Susan Parker, boom, there it is. Wow. And I just got goosebumps because it was this incredible moment. You with me? Pam gives her a call. And she just got so emotional, so emotional straight out of the gates. I was sitting down. After four decades, Pam had solved the puzzle in four months. But before Pam tells Alan what she's found, she calls Tim Parker again. This time, he's home. Okay. I called back Tim, and he was a little bit non-trusting of me, and I assured him of my motives. I told him that I was helping someone that was very interested in knowing where he was. So you didn't say it I didn't was say his, his father. father? I didn't. I felt like I needed to sit down with Mr. Thomas before I did anything like that. And he said to me, I'm surprised. I didn't think anyone cared enough about me to look for me. Tim said that? He did. And if he only knew. Wow. Pam believes this is the type of news you need to deliver in person. So she heads back out to Washington State. It's a case that felt overwhelming to me. And now that I get to get in a car today and go see Mr. Thomas, this man that's had this broken heart for 40 years, to be able to sit in front of him and give him this news, I mean, that's incredible. It really is incredible. Hi. Hey, hey, hello, hello. My Come on in. Come friend. on. <laughs> How, How are you? you? Oh, I'm fine, fine. How are you? Oh, I'm glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you guys. So I just yeah. happen to be in the neighborhood. Well, good. I heard you got some fairly good news. Yeah, I've got progress is what I have. Progress is good news. Oh, okay. When Pam sits down with Charlene and Alan, he's girding for a legal battle. I'm the one that lost all the rights. Now, all of a sudden, they're in the States. Now, I lost all my rights in the state, and I can't find them. What law am I going to go under? I still have a right to know who in the hell adopted them. Pardon me. Alan still hasn't figured out why Pam has returned to his living room. He assumes the search has been in vain. Do you think I came all this way out here to show you paperwork? I don't know. I, I, I guess, I don't know. I, I thought I had to sign something so we can go to court. But if you need me to go to court, I'll go. We don't need to go to court. Why well, not? What did you, did you find out there? I found both of them. No way. Way. <sighs> I found them. They're both alive. And they're in the States? They're in the States. Charlene seems to grasp the significance first. Oh my gosh. Alan looks stunned. I have been slowly chatting with your son. I spoke with him and he doesn't know that you're searching for him yet, but he is expecting a call today if you're up to it. Oh my God. Oh yes. Yeah, we're up for it. His immediate knee jerk reaction is, do they want to talk to me? Is this going to be OK? And I said, they actually both want to talk to you. He was afraid that they thought, and they had thought, mm -hmm. that he had abandoned them. Right. And Alan's biggest fear is about to be confirmed. One of the things he said, I said, did you ever think about finding anyone in your birth family? And he said to me, I didn't think it was possible. And he said, and quite honestly, I didn't think anyone ever cared enough about me to look for me. But now, Dad, now, because he was a little kid and he couldn't know. He didn't understand. But now you're going to be able to show him. That's going to be such a blessing for him. So messed up. They felt abandoned. <laughs> but, Dad, you didn't abandon them. I know that. But they and now didn't. he gets to know that. Yeah, After all those desperate decades, the moment Alan has waited for half his life is almost here. But when Pam offers to get the twins on the phone, Alan hesitates. It's all just too much. No, I just got to get it together. They're I want to get it together for my phone call. It's OK if you cry. It is OK. Anybody would cry. How I you didn't I got to take a break, yeah. Take a break. After 40 years and many months of investigation, the story of what happened to Alan Thomas's twins, last seen in Korea, can finally be told. In May of 1976, a plane from Seoul, South Korea, arrives at New York's Kennedy Airport. Aboard are two Korean children, brother and sister, twins. 
Alan Thomas's lost children coming to live in the same country as their father. If only he had known. Hi. Here she is, the nice twin Alan named Sandra, now called Susan, all grown up. The little girl in those pictures all those years ago, missing from her father's life for decades. Lost, and now at long last, found. She says all she remembers as she and her brother flew to America is being alone. If there was a tearful, heart-wrenching goodbye with their mother, Susan doesn't remember it. What do you remember about your mom? Sad thing is, I don't remember much. Really? I see her off and on, in and out the door of the house. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I don't recall anything about talking to her, hugs, kisses, nothing like that. She wasn't affectionate with you? I don't recall. She does recall a stay in an orphanage in Korea and then a long flight to somewhere. We were in an airplane. We flew and we landed and here's some people grabbing us. Someone that we don't even know. Speaking a language you didn't speak. No, didn't even understand what they're saying either. <laughs> right. Oh, I have to just tell you, my heart just breaks. I'm about to cry, but I'm being very <laughs> strong here. That's a really traumatic thing to happen to two little children. Yes. She and her brother, originally James, now named Timothy James, are taken to their new home in rural Pennsylvania, where they and five other adopted children are all raised by Jean Parker, a single mother and a professor at this local university. Susan says someone back in Korea, probably in a misguided attempt to comfort her, had told her that if she didn't like America after 10 days, she could come home. So I counted 10 days, packed my stuff, and started walking. So 10 happy. days, you were like, okay, I'm done. I want to go home. I'm ready. I got my stuff ready. I'm walking. Didn't even realize that it's overseas, but somehow I'm going. How far did you get? <laughs> End of the driveway. <laughs> and what do you remember about Jean, the woman who adopted you? Amazing woman. I'm very grateful for this lady who adopted seven kids. Without her, I don't know where I'll be. Susan thrived in school. She was voted most studious and most athletic. She went on to get a degree in education. She lives in Wisconsin now with her husband and two children who have never known their grandfather. Tim struggled finding his way in the world, but he's doing well now. He's a trucker and a driving instructor living in Missouri. They never heard from their biological mother, Connie, after coming to the United States. In college, Susan wrote her a letter. I am doing okay, how are you? Stuff like that, but nothing mean. You didn't I want to say the first word would be why, question mark, but no, I didn't do that. You didn't write why. No. What were you hoping for? I was hoping to get something back from her, whether it's just a simple hi, just something back saying, hey, I'm okay, and so on, but nothing. They moved. So you were never told that you had a father who had been in your life for the first few years of your life? Never. Never seen the pictures. I haven't heard nothing about having a dad. Now Alan, with his daughter Charlene by his side, is about to speak to his newfound twins. They were four years old when he last saw them. They are now 48. Are you ready to do this? Yeah. OK, I'm going to dial this for you. What was your biggest fear? Well, they want anything to do with me. What was the single most important thing you think they needed to hear? That I didn't abandon them. That you always loved them, and you were always looking for them. Yeah. They always had a family. Hi, Tim. Pam gets Tim on the phone. So, Tim, this has been a long road. I am actually working with your biological father. Biological father? Yes, your American father has been searching for you for a long time, but let me explain what happened. Wait, 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 wait you tell me he's still alive? I am telling you he's still alive, yes. Is this Tim? How are you doing? And yeah. then it's time for a long overdue father-son talk. I've been looking for you for a long time, and I'm glad I finally got a hold of you. Well, I, I just can't believe this is... This is my actual father. Well, it is. Believe me. The last time I saw you was in 1971 in Korea. I'm just very happy that you found me, and I'm happy that I'm talking to you. 
actually have a father. Yes, of course, you've always had a father. We never forgot you. You've always been a member of this family. You didn't know it, but you always have been. You know, always will be. And now it's time for Alan to talk to the other twin, his daughter, Susan. He has missed so many milestones. Hello. Okay, Susan. You're a hard girl to track down. I've been looking for you for quite a while. <sighs> I just can't believe this is real. I mean, I can't believe I'm talking to you. I know. I am too. It's hard, isn't and it? I know. And I mean, I'm all I... grown woman, and here I am acting like a baby, crying. No, no, you're not. No, you're not. Besides that, you're still my baby, so it's all right. <laughs> It's okay. Making those emotional phone calls, Alan discovered something that concerned him. How long has it been since you and Tim have seen each other? The twins haven't seen each other or even spoken in 12 years. They can't even remember how they fell out of touch. But when we bring Tim and Susan to New York City... Hi. Hi, Hi Tim. I'm Elizabeth. Yeah. And you know your sister. <laughs> the twins quickly embrace. How you doing? <laughs> Come have a seat. They've been speaking to Alan on the telephone, and they know the odyssey he endured to find them, including those changed birth dates. So you actually have a different birth date. Yeah. I hate to tell you guys are older by a year than you thought you were. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Not good news, Susan. <laughs> Surrounded by images provided by Alan, Tim is brought back to his childhood. I remember that we took those pictures, and that's always on my mind. Photographs and phone calls are one thing, but what Alan really wants to do is put his arms around the children he lost when he was just a young father. Are you ready to meet your twins? Yeah. All right, come on, let's go. After more than 40 years, it is going to happen. Alan Thomas is about to have a face-to-face -face family reunion just about half a century in the making. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, you guys did a pretty good job. A worldwide search launched by 2020 located his long-lost twins in the United States. And the moment of truth is about to replace the mementos that he's carried close to his heart all these years. That handful of photos. Yeah. That's all I had uh, all these years, so I just, wherever I went, they went. We've brought them all to New York, and as the twins approach, the expectations are building to a crescendo. I think we're just real excited to be able to see their face and touch them. Because then it's real? Because, yeah. To me, they still look like the little kids in the picture. Are you ready to meet your twins? Yeah. All right. Come on. Long time. Let's go. How many years in the making? 40-something years. Susan, this is your dad. Tim, this Come is on. your dad. Hi. 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 Yeah. Boy. A reunion with the most fantastic of expectations has been realized. You are my actual father. I just, I'm standing right here looking at you, and I still cannot get the grasp that you're my oh, father. We gave the twins their first look at their original birth certificates, which Alan had kept all these years. You see, that's the original. And that was my name, James mm -hmm. Alan Thomas. Put your first name as your middle name. Mm hmm Timothy James. And a keepsake only a parent would cherish. This here I used to give you baths in. Believe it or not, you, both of you almost drowned a couple of times. <laughs>
But the old family photos bring up hard feelings for the twins sent away by their birth mother. Your mom looks kind of glamorous in that photo. Yeah. She does. She looks very pretty. And you do look a lot like your mother. I just, every time I look at it, I just get frustrated. Me, me too. I do. Really? And forgive me for saying that. I mean, yeah, I do, there's right? some hatred in me, which I should never have that, but you're kind of mad, you know? It is a terrible way to remember your mother. But their half-brother, Jame, and his wife in Korea say there is another side to the story. My mother-in-law thought that Ellen had left her and the kids because he met someone while he was in Vietnam. So why were the children sent to the U.S.? It meant huge success at the time to be going to America, equivalent to paradise. Everyone would dream of going to the land of the U.S. Your mother. ABC Seoul bureau chief Ju Hee Cho says Jame and his wife believe Connie regretted giving the twins up for adoption. It seems to have haunted her until the day she died. She would just go to anyone in the neighborhood and say, if you see any twins, Korean-American twins looking for Mrs. Pei, that's me, that's me, make sure that they call me. And she would just look over the photo albums and her daughter-in-law said she'd just cry and just touch the photos. Jane has one more family secret hidden in an old ginseng box. It's a tin time capsule stuffed with mementos of a life that might have been. Snapshots of Connie, letters from Alan, and look at this, the savings bonds Alan sent all those years ago. She had saved them all her life. Is it possible she planned to give this modest inheritance to her twins one day when they returned? If so, that day never came. Alan's Facebook page is percolating tonight. Hundreds of well-wishers like the news of the big reunion. This is the best news ever. OMG, amazing. So glad for you all. So, so wonderful. So overjoyed. It's good to see him reunited with his children. I hope that they can make up for the lost time. I am in tears. Few people in life, in their jobs, have the chance to do something that changes somebody's life, which is what you've done for these three people. What is that like? It's amazing. I feel, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm emotional. I've been doing this 20 years. <laughs> I feel blessed that people trust me enough to allow me into their world. It's an honor when you get to say this is over. The healing is gonna begin. I'm a lucky girl. And the Thomas family feels lucky to be hitting New York City's Koreatown to remember their roots and catch up. The twins tease their dad, trying to get him to try the fermented Korean favorite kimchi. Just right there. But Alan is satisfied simply to savor their company and enjoy their first family dinner in 44 years. We are so happy that family can finally be together. And if you have a lost loved one you've been searching for, let us know. Go to our website at abcnews.com slash 2020. We may contact you about a future searcher's story. Incredible reunion. Thanks so much for watching tonight. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Mueller. From all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, have a good night. Great weekend.